So a couple of days ago, a new subscriber of mine, Jennifer Suze, hi Jennifer, commented on an old video I made where I recommended 16 books in nine minutes. And it wasn't until she left that comment that I realized it's been a long time since I've done one of these. So I thought, why not do another one today? So what I'm gonna do is grab 13 books off my shelves back here, books that either I haven't talked about on the channel or I haven't talked about them nearly enough and run through them kind of rapid fire style and recommend to you 13 books in 15 minutes. Let's go. The first book I wanna talk about is the newest book that I've read on this list, and that's The Service by Frankie Mirren. The Service is a powerful, challenging book about the sex industry. It was released last year, and it is about women's bodies and their autonomy and privilege and power and sex and control. It's about three women, Lori, who has a young daughter and has been working in the sex industry for a really long time, but recent raids by the police is has her kind of terrified for her life and she thinks she's gonna get caught and she's gonna have her daughter taken away from her. Another woman is named Freya. She's just getting into the industry and she realizes that this industry pays a lot better than say working in an office does. And then there's Paula, who's a journalist who is essentially working on a story to try to take these women and their industry down. Each of these women is just progressively drawn into each other's sphere and by the end it becomes this really tense almost almost thriller but it's that great book about sex that is able to be sexy on one hand but also kind of ridiculous and poke fun at some of the lunacy involved in it it's really really good it's such a page turner it's such an easy book to read if you're interested in stories about this industry i would absolutely recommend it and i just wanted to thank jasmine from jasmine reads for uh, tipping me off to this book last year. The next book I want to talk about is The Color of Water, A Black Man's Tribute to His White Mother by James McBride. This is about Ruth McBride Jordan, a light-skinned woman who was the mother to 12 black children. She was a woman who would never admit to her whiteness living in the ghetto with her family. And she was kind of an embarrassment to James McBride as he was younger, but as he gets older and he learns more about her, about her pain, about her past, about what she was going through. Her life was just amazing. She was Jewish. She was born in Poland. She had to flee pogroms and uh, her family emigrated to America. Her father was abusive. Her mother was handicapped. And at 17, she fled from her family, moved to the city and married a black minister. It's so heartbreaking, but beautiful and tender and so thoughtful and being able to kind of retell the story of his own parent and reshape his view of his mother as he's writing this story. It was, it's just beautiful to watch. It's, 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 it's really good. Next is Morality Play by Barry Unsworth. This takes place in the 14th century about a troupe of actors who normally only perform religious plays or only allowed to perform religious plays, but their group's leader decides that they want to recreate the story of a murder that has kind of taken hold of the town at the time. A young boy had been found dead and this mute deaf girl had been blamed for his death and so she was about to be hanged. So as they try to learn about the circumstances around the murder to create their play, they start to uncover some things and unravel the story that everyone is telling about this murder and they, they start to discover that this might not have happened the way people think it has happened. It's tons of fun. And this is a book that I don't think many people really know about. So I think uh, it's definitely, of, of all these books, uh, this is one of the ones that excites me the most. Next is a book that I've talked about before on the channel, but very briefly, probably not enough. That is Brewed by Jackie Polzin. I quasi read this book with 15 of my closest internet friends, Brewed Group. I see you. What's up? Love you all. So yeah, we had a group chat that uh, was started around this book as we all wanted to read it and it just became a chat all on its own and it's totally drastically changed all our lives. But Brood is about this woman who is grieving and it takes place over the course of one year of her life and to help in her grieving process, she takes care of four chickens. She is grieving the loss of a very special life. She takes up this task of caring for these chickens, 
kind of unbeknownst to her, I think, uh, to try to, to, to heal that wound that is now there. She has lost the confidence that she can care for somebody, that she can be responsible for someone else's life. And so the process of caring for these four chickens becomes about something a lot bigger than caring for the four chickens, even though most of the story is about caring for these four chickens. Next is Francis and Bernard, one of my favorite epistolary novels I've ever read. It's by Charlene Bauer, and it is about two people who meet at an artist's retreat. They leave, Bernard writes Francis a letter, and they start up this, this fast friendship that becomes something more than a friendship, and pretty soon it kind of takes over both of their lives. But as with my favorite epistolary novels, it's not just about this budding romance. The book is about faith, it's about passion, it's about friendship, and it's about sacrifice. It's about how we can lose ourselves by falling in love with someone else. It asks the question of how much should you give up to be in love with someone? How much should you give up to make something work? How do we love and honor this person while still being able to love and honor ourselves? It's terrific. Next might be my favorite book of all of these books. It's Carter Beats the Devil by Glenn David Gold. This is one of my favorite historical fiction books ever. The book starts out with Carter the Great, who's a magician in the early 20th century, taking up President Warren G. Harding onto the stage with him. He does a trick with President Harding, and by the end of the trick, people think that he has killed the president, and so he goes on the run to try to escape with his life. And then throughout this story is weaved kind of the story of his life and how he got here. It takes place in pre-Depression America, and it's it's a time when, it's, it's kind of like one of the last times in the world where magic still felt like it was possible. Illusion felt like truth. If you like vaudeville, if you like the vibe of, of early 20th century Americana, if you love magic and magicians and the, and the stage, I think you would really, really, really like this book. It's like 600 and, yeah, it's almost 650 pages long and it flies by because the book is just so much fun. Now from the longest book in this list to the shortest book, it is 124 pages long. That is The Wind That Lays Waste by Selva Almada. It's about a reverend who is driving across Argentina with his young daughter. Their car breaks down and they have to pull into the workshop of a man named Gringo and his teenage son. The book takes place over the course of the day as Gringo is fixing the reverend's car. And it's just about the, the relationships that form very quickly and very intimately between these four people. And it gets into God and morality and like moral relativism and the conversations that they have around all these themes are just really, really fascinating. Reading this book just feels like you get to sit in the corner and watch really interesting conversations happen for a couple of hours. Lily King's Euphoria, no, not Euphoria that you're watching on TV right now. I just wanted to bring this up again because Lily King's book, Writers and Lovers came out last year, I think. And so she kind of got back into the zeitgeist, got back into you know, public conversation on YouTube talking about her book. And it just feels like euphoria has been lost already. This book came out in 2014 or 2015, I think. And is I think it is so superior to Writers and Lovers. I just don't want people to forget about it. It's about three anthropologists who meet each other studying this tribe in New Guinea. And it's just about the intellectual and emotional ties that they create while they're there. It gets very intense, it gets very heated. There's very much a triangle going on between these three people. It's about desire between the three of them, but it's also about th their passion for each other and their passion for their work. And it's also about the exploration that happens in their work and in their lives. It's powerful, that's all I can say. If I'm gonna give it a one word review, it is powerful. Next is a book that came out a couple of years ago and seemed to get some traction and then seemed to disappear and that's The Wanderers by Meg Howery. This is a book about colonizing Mars. So when this book starts, the colonization of Mars will start happening in four years. So they need to prove that human beings can live like this. So three people, Helen, Yoshi, and Sergey, have to live together in the most realistic simulation they possibly can 
for 17 months. And the reasons that the three of them have committed to this test form the basis for, for a lot of the story. Helen is a retired um, astronaut from NASA and she just, she feels irrelevant for the first time in her entire life. And this is a chance at, at doing something special again, because nothing has felt meaningful since that part of her life was over. Yoshi is in love with a woman that he feels like he doesn't deserve. And so this is kind of putting himself to the test to prove his own worthiness to her and to himself. And Sergei just wants to go to Mars so badly. He will do anything to make that happen and to make his two sons proud. And these three desires start to kind of bang into each other and complicate one another. And the three of them discover that just going through this simulation is every bit as hard as it would living on Mars. And so reading the book has the feeling of kind of being able to, to stand off to the side and watch this really interesting social experiment happen. The, it, it starts as this quest of discovery about Mars and about the uh, the mission that they're going to go on. And by the end, it's really about the discoveries that they find within themselves and within the people that they've been staying with. Next is another memoir slash piece of history. Uh, that's Mrs. Gaskell and Me by Nell Stevens. This tells two stories congruently. One is of Nell Stevens and her life, and one is about uh, Elizabeth Gaskell. So in the 1850s, Elizabeth Gaskell completes one of her most famous works, the biography of uh, Charlotte Bronte, one of her good friends. To escape the fervor and the reviews and potential backlash of that book coming out, she takes her daughters and she goes to Rome on a holiday. And while she's there, she meets a man 17 years younger than her and falls in love with him. And she's married at the time, but she knows that this can never be her life. She can never be with this man. So she takes her daughters, she goes back home. And when she gets there, she discovers that her husband, Mr. Gaskell, has betrayed her in a way that she's not sure she can ever forgive. And now at the same time, the book is telling the story of Nell Stevens as she's living in London, getting her PhD. She is writing about Mrs. Gaskell at the same time that she meets a man named Max and has this very interesting relationship with him. And as that relationship starts to fracture, she starts to see and feel parallels with Mrs. Gaskell, who she's writing about. And it's just fun to see these two storylines kind of line up in really unexpected ways. It's a really bittersweet book, but Nell Stevens, is, she's just so lovely. I just, I just love her memoirs so much. She wrote the book Bleecker House a couple of years before this came out. Her first novel, Briefly, A Delicious Life, comes out this summer, I believe, which I'm so excited for. But yeah, it's just a delightful little memoir. It's just so easy to read. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Okay, next is probably the most fun book on this list. It's This Is Where I Leave You by Jonathan Tropper. At this point, maybe most people would know this story by the movie that came out uh, a number of years ago based on this book. It stars Jason Bateman and Tina Fey and Adam Driver. And it's about a family who comes home to sit Shiva after their father passes away. It's three brothers, a sister and a mother, and all of their relationships have really gone to shit over the last couple of years. And so when their father dies, it's the thing that gets them back together for the first time in a while. And they have to sit Shiva together and they have to work stuff out. If you're in the mood for a book that's kind of like a rom-com, but has some depth to it, I think you'd really enjoy it. Next is ironically the most dreary book on this list. That's Gould's Book of Fish by Richard Flanagan. This is about a talented forger who is sent to the world's most dangerous penal colony in Tasmania in the early 1800s. He is ordered to paint a book of fish while he's there, but he takes the opportunity afforded to him with the, the, the tools he's given to also write about his experience while he's there. This is a book I've really come to appreciate over time. I've reread this two or three times in the probably 15 years since I read it the first time. It's not the easiest, most accessible book. This person, I mean, he lives in one of the most chaotic, terrifying prisons known to man, and he's kind of losing his mind, and the narrative is a bit circuitous, we'll say. I think if you enjoy non-linear, somewhat surreal storytelling, I think you'd quite like this book. But that's the sort of story I typically don't enjoy. The first time I read the book, I was just floored by Flanagan's writing. I was just so taken in by 
just the vibe of this book, but I thought it might be more literary than maybe it is productive. Every time I've gone back to this book, I've learned more and more and I've liked it more and more. And finally, for all the music fans out there, there's absolutely on music, Conversations with Seiji Ozawa by Haruki Murakami. This book is about 300 pages long and it's essentially one long, gorgeous conversation between Murakami and Ozawa about their love of music. Ozawa is the former conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And if you're just a fan of music or for or, or just love reading about like the passion behind music, I would highly recommend this. Murakami, I didn't know this until I, I read it. He ran a jazz club in Tokyo before he p ever published anything. He knows so much about music and he's able to have such interesting conversations with Ozawa. It's, it's I, l I love every bit of this book. If you love like really smart people, talking about really smart things in really smart ways and, and have that be entertaining, read this book. It's, it's awesome. So there you go, 13 book recommendations. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Rick McDonnell. Hope you like some of the books I talked about. If you get to them eventually, I think you'll be really happy. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in a couple days. Bye.